Good afternoon, guys, gals, and non-binary pals, and welcome to another exciting episode of Blether Together. My name is Stephen Payton, and I'm joining you today from the National Headquarters, and sitting in the studio with me is our regular Angela Haggerty from Common Space, and Dr. Craig Dial, who has many faces, I guess, <laughs> where, where you're kind of like, plant your flag. Uh, so thank you both for joining me. In the studio today, um, this is your weekly programme of news and politics from Scotland and around the world, but as always, we don't want to be doing all the talking, even though we are going to do all the talking. But we do want to see your comments down below, as always, because we do read them, we do respond to them, and we do read them out every now and then if somebody makes a good point on the discussion that we are having. So or please pays do. Us compliments. Or pays us compliments. Or hate. We tend to read that out as well, because uh, we just like the attention. Please do leave your comments down below, as well as give this video a wee share, uh, pop it out there as you can, because it helps us get a bigger audience, so if you like the show, that's one way that you can support us, is by helping us grow our audience. And hello to you, Barbara, for being our first person to comment today, so you get a special Hi. mention from all of us. Uh, thank you. Okay, so, I, I guess the big news this week has obviously been London. Um, what's happened in London, and uh, we definitely should at least mention it, even if we don't want to talk about it too much, because... Uh, it is obviously the thing that's kind of dominating the headlines. I don't really want to go into much speculation because information is still coming out about who was involved with it, how many people were picked up afterwards. Um, so, so I really don't think we should go into that. But one of the areas I think we should focus on is the whole of Parliament and what kind of happened there. And Angela, you were actually in the Parliament yeah. at the time. Uh, what, what was it like? Well, I, I actually, by the time they suspended the sitting, I had just left because I was speaking at an event in the afternoon in Edinburgh. Um, so when they did finally suspend it, I, I wasn't there, but our reporters at Common Space were. Because um, we'd all gone up to Edinburgh for the day to work from the Parliament, because most of us are based in Glasgow. We have Michael Gray, who's based in Edinburgh, and we thought, oh, well, we'll go for a road trip, take Common Space on the road, because it was going to be such a, a historic vote. And of course, the way everyone's, you know, the place is buzzing all day. Finally, go and sit in the press gallery, and Nicola Sturgeon comes in. The MSPs are all seated. The debate begins, and it was pretty much right then that the news started to come through um, via Twitter that something had happened. And of course, um, you know that 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 disrupted everything. You could see MSPs were on their phones. The press gallery were, were glued to their phones. I don't think anyone was paying attention to the debate by that point. Then Nicola Sturgeon promptly left the chamber, and Ken McIntosh, the presiding officer, left. And, there was a, a bit of back and forth of people coming and going um, and presumably that was because they were all going to get security briefings and decide whether they were going to carry on with the debate for the, de for the day. Um, so, uh, I, you know, it was, it was absolutely the right thing for them to suspend it and I know that some people said, well, is that, does that mean that there's a kind of a, an interruption to democracy and is that not what terrorists want? Well, not really because yesterday nobody could concentrate. You have to remember that MSPs have colleagues in London as well. Um, no less the SNP, the, the 56 MPs um, in Westminster, um, they would have been deeply concerned, I think, about them. And then, of course, the Tories, Labour and Lib Dem also have an MP down there. So it was absolutely right, I think, that it's it was suspended and adjourned for the day. If anything, for all, also, it's just... Uh, it would have been disrespectful and insensitive, I think, to carry on with it. Democracy will carry on. It's mm -hmm. carrying on today. You know, there, there's a time to make that point, but there's also a time to, to sit and reflect on, yeah. on the victims and yeah. pay some respect to that. So I think it was the right thing to do. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, that I think there has been a sense of solidarity right across the country um, with people um, kind of coming together and being determined that an attack like this won't prevent life going on and um, you know it's just it's difficult to get that balance I think between being vehement about that um, but also being able to mourn at the same time mm. so it's just it's that kind of odd stage at the moment where you do have MSPs and MPs going back to work and and making that point but at the same time I think you know, reports coming through were, were at the, certainly at the Westminster Parliament that some of the MPs were finding it really very difficult to get up and speak. They were very emotive because this is as real really as it gets for them. Yeah, and I, I think it was right to, to um, delay it as well um, for, for the same reasons of um, it would have been insensitive to continue on. And I understand the argument that some people have made that um, it's, it's, you can't let terrorism get in the way of these things. And I think that's been shown by the fact that everyone's gone back to work yeah. today. But more than that as well, like considering what was being debated, 
I think having a vote to begin the process of leaving a parliament that had been attacked by a terrorist like three hours earlier mm -hmm. would have been an awful decision and it would have been something that would have just been I think continuously brought back up again um, moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, of course the debate was going to pick back up again and it is, it's going to take uh, place next week. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, the SNP and the Greens want to delay a week to kind of give enough time um, following what happened. It was the it was Labour, the Lib Dems, the Conservatives that wanted to have it today. You wanted to bring it back That's right in today again. Yeah, it is quite interesting. And I think it's because, well, actually, I'm not entirely sure why it was, but it does seem like it, it would have been insensitive to hold it today. It is good that um, there's a little bit of time between um, what's happened and this this vote, um, especially because it is going to be you know, pretty significant when it kind of is voted on. I yeah. think, yeah, I mean, um, the... The decision has been to hold it on Tuesday, which is the day before Article 50 is going to be mm. triggered. Um, so I think that pro probably around about that time of next week, you will start to see the news cycle um, go back to things about Brexit. Uh, uh, we're unlikely to see too much of that unless there's any huge developments. I think over the weekend, mm. it, probably coverage is going to be very focused on what's happened yesterday. And then I think we're going to start to see it switch back over to it because Article 50 is such a big thing. So, yeah, in terms of actually getting back to debate and everybody being back in that kind of headspace, I think Tuesday probably is much better than if MSPs were to go back into the chamber today and try and discuss it. It's also a huge issue of national importance, um, the the debate in Scotland right now and the, and the vote that will be coming up. And, um, and in some ways, uh, it, it still seems... Like, I mean, it would absolutely be overshadowed by what's going on in Westminster. It wouldn't feel like what was happening in Scotland was part of a national conversation. And it should be. You know, it, sh it should be something that everyone has um, has the, the access to be involved in. And, um, and it certainly would have been dwarfed, I think, by coverage of everything else that's going on. So I think moving it to next week, when it's closer to the Article 50 thing, it's much more likely, actually, to be included in the wider discussion that's going on and so it should be because it's Brexit really that's, mm. that's put us in this position so I, I think that the SNP and the Greens have, have called that right I think it would have been too early to go back to it today yeah, but agreed. Uh, it's there's a bit of politicking going on, I think, already, and, and we've seen, and we'll come to that a little bit later in, mm -hmm. in the program, uh, in the in the sense, in the way that some people have been responding to what happened at Westminster yesterday, yeah. um, and uh, that I, f I found very disappointing. Yeah. Um, we do want to hear your comments as well. If you think it was right to suspend Parliament yesterday, um, following the event, please do leave them down below. We are going to be reading them out and having a read through what you think as well. But um, yeah, Craig, what do you think? You think it was the right decision? It's my initial impulse um, was like a lot of folk, you, you know, you, you keep on carrying on. Um, but I think the, 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 the decision to suspend was a considered one. They did take their time and they, they were following the, 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 the brief as they were getting it on, on what was a live event. Um, so, so, yeah, I think they, 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 they followed the protocols that were there and they came to the, the, the right decision at the appropriate time, I think, so, yeah, and I, I do agree that just holding back for a couple of days, because the, the, the decision is important as it is, you know, we can afford to just hold back and take a couple of days to reflect, mm -hmm. and then we can get back in, get back into it, so, so yeah, I do support the decision. Yeah, okay. I mean, I don't know about you, but it doesn't feel like if the debate had, had resumed today, uh, even using Twitter and social media, I wouldn't have felt comfortable really talking about the Scottish constitutional question today. I still feel like there's just you should have that period where um where you just have a bit of kind of reflection and focus mm -hmm. on um on how this is going to be affecting and impacting people and show some sensitivity and some compassion there. So I think yeah, it's uh, we don't we don't really want to get into that really really rigorous political debate again I think until maybe next yeah. week mm -hmm. Okay so bringing in some comments from uh, those watching at home, we've got Stephen Burns who's saying that he thinks it's the uh, showing solidarity was the right call uh, Kelly Douglas saying it was definitely the right decision and um, Peter Rolfe uh, saying that suspending the parliament was probably correct as attention uh, should be with the victims and it shows respect rather than continuing on uh, with what we are doing um Yep, and Karen Kelly finishing off as saying that as soon as they realised the seriousness of the situation, they called it correct. So yeah. basically, unanimous decision so far um, <laughs> from, from our viewers. Apparently, that, you mean uh, we all agree on what? something? That's, That's unusual for the internet. Like. Is this the internet? Yeah. Um, 
But coming back to Angela, you were saying about um, discussing online what was happening, mm-hmm. and there was specifically some things that kind of caught your attention that were were less, uh, let's say, showing solidarity and a little bit more pernicious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and it's been difficult because I did tweet about this uh, last night, and I'm probably going to write about it this week um, in my column, uh, which covers social media, but. One of the things I've been reluctant to do is to get down, is to go down the road of naming names and naming sides in this, because it feels like you accidentally then just take part in it. It sounds as if you're taking a shot at a side for, um, for showing insensitivity. The truth is, I saw it from everywhere. I saw it from every side, from both sides, every side, as many sides as you can imagine, whether it was right and left that were fighting with each other, whether it was nationalists and unionists that were fighting each other, whether it was readers and journalists fighting with each other. You name a side, you name an argument, a divide, and I guarantee you that people on both sides of that, there were some people trying to sort of use the, the events yesterday to kind of take advantage to make political points. And it was appalling. It was absolutely horrible. Just hours, I mean, barely even hours after the news was coming through. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm running between events, running for trains. You're, you're, you're using Twitter as, as a breaking news feed, basically trying to get the latest pieces of information. And some of the bickering that you could see taking place before your eyes, when it's, and it's been interspersed with these sort of pictures of people's bodies, um, lying on roads and people are arguing over whether a parliament should have been suspended. It was just, it seemed like really you need to get a little bit of perspective here. People have just been killed. Innocent people going about their daily lives have just lost their lives. Step back, put your phone down, maybe take a deep breath and think about it. And it wasn't just readers, it wasn't just the members of the general public who we all love to have a go at for their terrible behaviour in social media. No, actually there were a lot of journalists and a lot of politicians taking part in this and I think a few people that have had to even take down tweets because they've realised how awful it was. Um, and that's including the Scottish Parliament as well. So I think people have been, there has been attempts to make some political capital out of this and I think the people that have done that ought to be utterly ashamed of themselves and hang their heads in shame. That is, you know, not to use too strong a word, but that is almost unforgivable. Is, and, and if that is a sign of things to come in the next two years, then we're going to have problems. I think people need to mm. really seriously think about what's important. And one thing, I, again, I tweeted this morning was that things like this, for me, actually make me realise how much common ground I have with people that I don't agree with. The people that I see on Twitter all the time really annoy me the most when you, when you find yourself on different sides of an issue. It's in times like this when you realise that actually when it comes to the really big things, we actually all agree on some very fundamental stuff. We, we have different routes, different paths to get there. But across particularly the Scottish constitutional question, there are certain issues that we all tend to be very, very united on. Ideas of equality, for example, democracy, you know, some very, very basic stuff that I think that we all respect. We just have different ways of getting there. Times like this make me realise how lucky we are, actually, that when everyone talks about division in Scotland, it is nothing like the kind of divisions that you see across the world. Actually, we are far more united on a lot of stuff in this country than people would have you believe for political purpose. So don't fall for that. Appreciate and celebrate the fact that you have that common ground with people. And um, and when the far right and your Tommy Robinsons and all of those people are throwing themselves in front of cameras in London to make their points, just ignore it. It's a Twitter passing. It happens in the bubble and it will go by as quickly as you saw it. Mm. Focus on what's important. It's interesting though. How That's my rant of the week. Is that it? That is my rant. I thought we were keeping it for later. No, I bumped it up. Ah, you bumped it up? On... Alright, well, the schedule's screwed I could, then. I, mean, it's I all could do it again apart. later. You know, <laughs> <laughs> for those tuning in later on. Uh, but it is really interesting, I think, to see how, in some ways, the, the far right have capitalised on this. And of course they would, it's just a given. But. You know, like Tommy Robinson, like running to the scene to kind of get on camera shouting about it. Um, Kay Hopkins on Fox News at the moment is talking about how, like, you know, um, London, London is scared, London is terrorised. Like London is just getting on with its day. Like, everyone's just back to work, everyone's just doing their thing again because um, the act of terrorism in London it is like a, it happened, people show solidarity, they're mourning, but everyone kind of gets on with it because they don't allow it to sort of have an impact on their life, and that's 
kind of what we've generally seen across the UK as it is. It was the same when, um, with Glasgow um, as well. And um, not to forget like Joe Cox as well, who actually has and some of the media coverage being chronically overlooked because it was a white guy that did it, so apparently it's not terrorism. Um, I love it when, when sort of quite privileged middle-class media people who, are, who don't really uh, live a normal life like everyone else's normal lives comment on how terrified they all are about living their normal lives. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Katie Hopkins, I don't think, really probably relates to most people at all um, and yet claims to speak for so many, and I think it's incredible. But, you know, I saw a great tweet today that said, you know, if, um, if Fox News it thinks that getting Nigel Farage and Katie Hopkins on is giving them an idea of what's going on in the rest of the world, then it's no, I it's no wonder that journalists have got no idea of what's going on in the rest of the world in America. And that's true, because, they, 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 you know, that just Katie Hopkins' view of things is not represented. And I lived in London not that long ago, a couple of years ago, not, not for a very long time. Hmm. It's a great city, a wonderful city, and it's full of very amazing and resilient people. Um, and I don't recognise Katie Hopkins or Tommy Robinson as part of that. That tweet probably explains a lot about what's going on with Donald Trump's Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, social media does tend to breed this very immediate reactionary, you know, first to comment on everything thing. Um, and I would just like to give a bit of advice out, out there for folk. If you're on, if you're on Twitter, you know. Take five seconds to reread what you're writing before you hit the send button. And if you wouldn't say it to someone's face, mm -hmm. don't say it online. Yeah. If we all did that, you know, things would probably be a, quite a bit healthier. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if you wouldn't say it in a crowded pub <laughs> on a Saturday night at about 11 o'clock, don't say it. <laughs> don't, don't say it in a forum that will never allow you to really delete it. Yeah. And it'll be there forever, um, marking that. But it is interesting, um, the point like we're, we're both talking about, um, about uh, uh, the, the, the way we view other countries being like whoever happens to pop up into our feeds. Mm -hmm. And um, quite often I think when we see people come on to speak from other countries, we just assume that they do have a grasp of what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, like, they could be anybody. Like, with America right now, specifically Fox News profiling Farage and Hopkins as if that's actually a fair gauge of the state of things when it's, it's not. Um, they, they, they're, they have a very specific agenda. It's really interesting. If, Nigel if, Farage can't get elected in the UK, remember? Seven yeah, times yeah. he has failed trying. So that's how much he represents the voice of the people here. Yeah. And he's in a parliament. He's just managed to take his... Well, basically make himself redundant then. But, um... It's really interesting like, to actually bring it back a little bit to one of the funny, fun things I've been talking about with the independence referendum was that um, historically with this whole um, idea of like Spain's veto, Spain having a veto and Scotland having entry into the European Union. Um, I was having a chat with the wee ginger duck the other day and um, he was talking about um, the experts who were being wheeled out to talk about you know, Spain saying from their parliament that they would block or veto Scotland trying to get into the EU. It was pretty pointed out the actual people that they were wheeling out were the equivalent of like the Nigel Farage's, like these like yeah. fringe parties who were, mm. if, if they were even elected, they were the ones constantly being wheeled out and it was just kind of like, that's not representative when in fact the reality is, as we have seen in other news since then, that Spain isn't going to block Scotland mm. coming into the EU. That sort of thing, but um, I guess it just comes back to like being being careful about who your sources are and where they're coming from. And yesterday was a perfect example of be careful where your sources are coming from, and um, because in the kind of rush to like report and things quickly, so some very serious mistakes were made, um, including naming the wrong person as the as the shooter, um, sorry as the attacker. Uh, that I mean, that was a huge error um, by a very large news corporation who should know better. Um, Sources, and sources they, have, are they have apologised. They have apologised. Yeah, they've taken it very seriously. Which was why I wasn't going to name and shame there. I was just going to kind of yeah. leave it at that because yeah, they did. They they owned the mistake and kind of like moved on from it, which is great. Um, but but we we do we do need to be very careful of the sources that we're taking information from, particularly in times where there is like a crisis, um, and 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 something that is very fast moving, like yesterday. Do you know, I really like the idea of like people tuning into this programme for a flavour of what's going on in Scotland and Stephen saying, I was chatting to the wee ginger dog. <laughs> it's right behind us, by the way. It's, like, it's just me sitting in this room talking to a cardboard cutout. That's not weird. <laughs> <laughs>
as you do. But, uh, but he, sorry, to put that into context, I realize if you, if you don't really know the way Ginger Dog, he's one of our columnists. But he lived, he lived in Spain for a long time. It's not actually a dog. No, it's, it's not. A well, there is a dog, <laughs> but his name is Paul. Um, it's not, not as if uh, Stephen's other sources is just a random flock of seagulls he talks to in the park every week. <laughs> just like my two journalist sources, a wee Ginger Dog and a flock of seagulls. It's like national exclusive, the skies are not safe. Stacey goes. I'm going to set up that Twitter account gets a retweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Paul Paul Kavanagh, who writes the Wee Ginger Dog column, um, like he lived in Spain for a long time, so he knows what he's talking about. Like he actually he knows really the politics over there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so he he does actually understand what is happening in the Spanish Parliament and the kind of discussion around Catalan and where that fits in with Scotland and where it really doesn't. Um, so you know, I'd really recommend reading his stuff. It's great. Okay. I think we've kind of talked about the, the London thing quite a bit. Um, I'd like to sort of move the conversation on a little bit to, well, a little bit more about the actual debate in the Scottish Parliament and what was happening before, obviously, everything kicked off in London um, and, and, and where the focus was on that of, of asking for the Section 30 order. So if, if anyone doesn't know, um, the Scottish Parliament was debating, requesting a Section 30 order from Westminster, which, if granted, means that the power to hold a referendum is temporarily devolved from the Westminster um, uh, Parliament to Holyrood. So we can basically have our, have a referendum. Um, and there was a discussion going on yesterday and the day before, uh, which was to culminate in a vote for the Scottish Parliament to move ahead with requesting a Section 30 order. So was anyone watching the coverage of that? Oh, yeah. I assume quite, you were, uh, yeah, you bet you were right yeah, in there. Yeah. How, how was it for you? That's, uh, that's, that's my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it is a, it's an interesting experience watching it, knowing that this isn't a debate that's designed to necessarily change people's minds in the chamber. I think everybody in the chamber knows how they're going to vote, mm -hmm. and all the parties have their, their positions very firmly laid out. Um, so some some of the speakers have have, have been on, on both sides have been more or less going through the motions, but there have been some excellent uh, speakers as well. I think um, Alex Neil I think mm. gave a very interesting speech. Uh, now he was he he's he's one of the MSPs that's been kind of attacked from the the unionist side because he quite um, uh, he quite prominently voted to leave the EU. Uh, and it's a position he's, he's, he's quite firm on. So the, the, the unionists have been saying this is a divide within the, 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 the party, potentially within the, the independence movement. Uh, he gave a very, very good speech outlining his position and outlining how he saw that the issue about the EU, about Scotland's relationship with Europe, shouldn't be closely tied in with the independence movement. It should be something that comes after. It should be something that we decide once we have the powers to make that decision. It's something we've been kind of arguing for with um, in, in, in Commonweal as well. And this has come from me, who, who, would, who would be arguing for us to, to join the EU again and, or, or you know, be in the EU as quickly as possible after independence. But I think I had a lot of common ground with Alice's speech and I thought that this is, this is one that people should should watch so mm. should maybe try and rip <coughs> rip that from the from from youtube and see if we can get that is it right around. Was it, is it right to say that you, he's essentially saying that we should have two referendums we should have a referendum to leave the uk and then a further referendum around the eu potentially yes i think that's 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 probably a valid position because you know a relationship scotland an independent scotland's relationship with europe is going to be different from Scotland within the Union mm -hmm. and Scotland's relationship with Europe, no matter which position we actually take. So I think it is a discussion we, we, sh we should have. I'm, I'm not afraid of referendums. I think they're the... the but aren't they all nasty and divisive? <laughs> Don't they tear the country <laughs> apart, Craig? <laughs> Only if you treat them with division. If you treat them as a positive expression of, of democracy, of public engagement, I think they can be a positive thing. Mm. Yeah, I think um, I think that's a point, and it's, uh, it maybe shows a slight divide that could emerge between because um, we're full of division, uh, the SNP and the wider independence movement. I mean, the SNP are quite clear that it's their policy to push for EU membership. The wider independence movement could make the case that, as you say, Craig, um, the relationship that Scotland has with Europe is going to be different as an independent nation than within the UK. So that should require a sec you know, another referendum. If 
for no other reason, even if it was a foregone conclusion, but it would sort of make it democratically legitimate to say that the people did vote to actually then join the European Union. Yeah. Um, so, so that the, there's cases, separate cases could be made there. I think for the idea of and that the idea of holding that second referendum um, for European Union membership that might help ease the concerns of some of the yes leave voters, which seems to be quite a sizable chunk, um, and that that you know nobody quite knows how to deal with yet in terms of the the yes campaign. I think so. That was quite interesting. It was. Um, Alex Neil's probably put himself out there quite a lot to number one appear to sort of defy what the party's official line is, um, and then number two to stand up in Parliament at the debate and say something like that. But I think it was important that someone, you know, for those yes leave voters, they need to know that they're part of this conversation, yeah. that they haven't just been sidelined suddenly yeah. from the independence movement because they feel differently about Europe. So I think that was important. Another. Um, contribution I found interesting was from Alex Rowley, the uh, Scottish Labour deputy leader. Mm -hmm. um, he looked almost like he was going to rebel at one point because he was talking about the importance of democracy and, and basically agreeing with, with Nicola Sturgeon on several points about the right of the Scottish people to choose. Yeah, there, um, was, there was that little moment where I was wondering which way that was going exactly, as well. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. were all very sort of silent going, is, is he, is he going to rebel? And then... Then what he what he fell back on um, was that there is there appears to be no support or not enough support among the general public in Scotland to call a second referendum. So he's basically using the polls as a sort of a, a, a as his reasoning there. But that leaves Alex Rowley open to the fact that if it, you know once Article Fifty is triggered and you know we start to get an understanding of where the EU is going to come in on this. Um, negotiation period if it's very hostile or if it just doesn't look good at all you could see support drastically change in Scotland. I mean, and even that said, all of this talk about polls depending on what poll you're looking at and what the question is, you get different results some people, you know, if they're asked if they want a referendum now, they'll say no but do you want a referendum in five years and they're like, well, you know, yeah that might not be a bad idea, I'd like to have the option so you get different results and I think that that's trying to boil it down to the people feel this way or the people feel that way that hasn't been helpful at all but should we get to a position where the polls overwhelmingly start to look like there's, a, there's, there's no question now people want a second referendum are people like Alex Rowell, I mean he's made the case, he's, he's already made the case and the only thing stopping him from agreeing with that is the polls. If they move then it would be amazing to see him sort of, uh, you know, tie himself into knots coming up with other reasons to do it. I find Scottish Labour interesting because I think that some MSPs must see that this is a non-sustainable position for them to take given the circumstances. And with the local elections coming up, if Scottish Labour take an absolute battering, do you think we're going to start to see a bit more rebellion on the independence question? Oh, uh, I don't. Do I don't know. know. I mean, I feel they're very deeply entrenched in that position of being against independence and being for the union. Uh, but then again, yeah, a couple more years of just seeing all power slip away from Scottish Labour and finding its way into the hands of the SNP and I'd, oh well, the Tories as well. But I'd argue also the Greens, which is not unimportant because they definitely have been coming after the Greens recently I think having recognised yeah, that there's a lot of support to, drifting to, to there. Mm -hmm. And interestingly to a certain degree. Yeah so I mean they can obviously see people on the left who don't want them um, to be part of the SNP or think the left are, the, the SNP, SNP are not left enough. And you can obviously see that support slipping to the Greens and that's why this kind of like attack campaigns come from them. So I, I could see that um, come a little bit further along time maybe some of them would start to go okay the, le the support for left ideas, the support for a lot of trade unionist ideas, they're all moving over to pro-independence groups. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's time we reevaluate that position. Mm -hmm. I can see that being a conversation that happens, although I don't necessarily know what the outcome could be. But I think it's, uh, it's interesting that you brought up um, specifically um, Alex's, how he, he talked about there not being enough support in Scotland just now, and that being like the reason why he was opposing a second referendum. Because for me... And come back to what you said as well, Craig, about how everyone knew what the conclusion was. I think as a result of that, there was a really interesting um, focus in the chamber, specifically from the Unionist parties, which wasn't about arguing against the second referendum 
exactly, or rather it wasn't arguing against independence. It was trying to set up the concept of holding a second referendum as an illegitimate venture. And I think this is something we're going to see it keep coming back to. It's why they kept saying that the SNP's manifesto did not commit to a second referendum, even though it absolutely did in terms of like the mandate. It's why we kept seeing challenges to the concept of a mandate. It's why we kept seeing specifically people challenging the Greens and saying their manifesto said something that, again, it didn't. Um, it's all about framing the referendum right now in terms of it being illegitimate. So that when it does pass, which it will, it is absolutely going to pass in the, whole, in the Scottish Parliament, the narrative that they'll be able to take from it is that the Scottish Parliament are pushing an illegitimate referendum onto everyone, and that's how they'll basically be able to combat it. That's what I see them doing. Mm-hmm. That's what I think will be the next stage in it, um, and, and basically be their focus for the next little period of time. We have been through this before. It seems like far too long ago now, but back in 2011, 2012, we were in this same position where we were told, oh, we didn't need a, an independence referendum, nobody wanted one. Mm. OK, you can have one, but you'll have it now on our t- timetable, on our terms. OK, we'll have to agree the terms now. And, and it, it's it's part of the game, I yeah. think. But that's it. I mean, but if they can't argue that none of the parties in Holyrood have a legitimate call to hold a second referendum. Like, if they do brush off the commitments in the Greens and the SNP's manifesto, it means that when Theresa May turns <coughs> around and says, now is not the time, again, they can say, well, it's not even legitimate, so, you know, is it really a democratic outrage? You, well, listen, do you know, a bit of me wonders about whether people are actually going to care in the long run about whether this is... You know, I see some of the haggling of the debate right now in the Parliament... Um, yeah, this is just the stuff for politicians who want to play the, the frame in the game thing. But at the end of the day, for me, um, if we get into that negotiation period and it really looks bad for the UK and it looks completely um, uncertain, etc, 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 and if the EU is playing hardball and people in Scotland start to think, no, this is serious, this is really, really serious, we've got a big decision to make. I don't think they're going to care that Ruth Davidson thinks it's illegitimate for them to make the decision because the SNP didn't follow the process she would like them to follow. I don't really think anyone's going to care about that. I think people in Scotland, well, I suspect that while there's not a great deal of support in the polls necessarily right now saying, yes, damn, we want a, refle- a, a referendum, I think people in Scotland since Brexit have felt much more calmed knowing that they have the option, that the option will be coming yep. to them, that should they need to make that decision again, they have got it there. And I think maybe that you know, when everyone's playing all of this politics, um, they, they miss the general mood. Yes, the polls might be saying one thing, but you're not asking why are they saying that. What exa- what What's going on? What's the process yeah. in people's minds in Scotland right now? What are they thinking when they're looking ahead? Why are the polls saying one thing for right now but something quite different for five years' time? What is it that people are trying to say? And I think politicians sometimes can be really bad at um, actually paying attention to people. You know, they, they, they look at them as a set of data sometimes. I think it's going to get very real for people quite soon. Article 50 has not been triggered. This has all been theoretical conversations since last June. We're going to get two big things coming up. We're going to get the Scottish Parliament with a mandate, a majority mandate, to go and ask for the Section 30 order, which to in the minds of other people is basically the Scottish Parliament agreeing that it wants a second referendum. That's the, the, the simple version of that. Yep. And number two, the process begins of Scotland leaving Europe. And I don't know about other people, but whenever I see that, you know, when that news came out that Theresa May will begin the process of leaving the EU on the 29th of March, I still get that sort of butterfly feeling in my stomach of, is this really happening? You know, there's been a, because we've had these months where nothing has really yeah. happened, it's almost been this little limbo where we're still part of the EU and we haven't really started leaving yet. And when, the closer we get to that point, the more sort of unsettled you feel. I think regardless, maybe you know, some Leave voters must feel that as well, just knowing the enormity of what's ahead. And that, that's when I think we're going to start to see much bigger changes in the way that the public are expressing themselves over this sort of stuff. And, um, you know, Ruth Davidson and Kezia Dugdale wanting to talk about legitimacy of votes. 
in the long run. I don't think that's. I don't think people are going to want to hear that. I don't think they're going to care about that if it push comes to shove. This could go entirely the other way, though, of course, mm -hmm. and it could look like the UK is going to get a fantastic deal at Brexit. I can't see it, but you know, if if it didn't look like it was going to be as bad, then perhaps they might have a bit more mileage with a you know here's a reason not to have another referendum argument. But mm -hmm. by all accounts, you know, the EU's. Uh, short version of, of a response to Theresa May was bring it on. You know, it was, we've been waiting, we've been ready, we've just been waiting for you to send a letter yeah. kind of attitude. No, it's, it's so, not going to... It's not going to work out in the UK's favour, and I think there's yeah. general consensus um, of, of of that um, for anyone who's really clued in. I'm going to bring in a question from someone else who's watching. So Marky Stewart is asking, do you think there is any chance of a third option going onto the ballot? Um, they don't, but they want to know our opinion. And of course, this is probably off the back of I assume Gordon Brown right. popping up again with oh, another yeah, yeah. another Gordon Brown intervention, okay. um, which we'd all been predicting for a while, um, but we're really. I, I mean, okay, as much it's as we're predicting it, this yeah, it's surprising. They've, yeah. they've just really thrown. The brown out there, um, but this is this argument of statement, uh, standing by it. <laughs> <laughs> but this um, this this thing of uh, federalism again, right. the same thing we were promised in twenty fourteen and uh, consecutive points since then, and now he's popped up and said it again. I mean, Craig, federalism is that is it going to happen? Is that even a possibility? Scottish Labour does not have the power to deliver federalism over yeah. the entire UK, and I don't think anybody has asked England if it wants it. Yeah. That's the short version of it. Yeah. If, if Scottish Labour and the Lib Dems, who also support their version of uh, federalism, if they are really actually serious about this option, they would be bringing out a detailed white paper with their roadmap to how they create it and each of the milestones they need to hit along the way. Until they do it, it's not an option. It's a political, it's a political ploy, it's, a political, it's meaningless words. And I've seen no evidence that they're planning even on, on thinking about writing that white paper. Hmm. It's amazing actually how little detail we have of this um, for, for, for parties that, that, that criticise so heavily um, you know, the SNP for its lack of a plan on anything independence-wise in Indy F1. Now, the white paper, for all its flaws, at least was a substantial document. At least was a serious attempt at starting to ask, answer some questions. We didn't even get that in Brexit. You know, Scotland actually did go to, to much greater lengths, I would say, to answer some of those big questions. On federalism, though, I, the, I, the irony of people criticising the lack of plans for other things and just repeating these lines about federalism, as Craig says, there's no white paper. I haven't hit, seen how any of this has been costed. What are the sums? How is this actually going to work? How does Wales feel about this? How does Northern Ireland feel about this? And of course, how does England yeah. feel about this? There's no appetite, it would seem, in the rest of the UK for a serious federal. There's no joining up of different parties, as far as I can see, in the, in the four nations of the UK to push through this idea of federalism. It's pie-in-the-sky stuff, it really is. Um, and how misleading would that be for those leaders of those parties to stand up in the Scottish Parliament and talk about this third option? Um, you know, what if the, the vote went their way on the constitution and there was no second referendum? Where is this actual plan for federalism? Or are people being sold down the river a little bit here? Um, I mean, I'm really concerned about that because it be, it's the lack of a plan. It doesn't seem like they're actually serious about it. It seems like that, you know, what, what is the, yeah. the people's constitution, the people's convention that, that Kezia Dugdale keeps talking about? They want to have some sort of an event where people could talk about these. You're like, this is really very fluffy stuff. There's nothing solid in there at all. And wheeling out Gordon Brown to make the same argument that he's made before about federalism. I mean, it, it just seems to me, it, it seems to me that it would be very irresponsible in answer to the question to put a third option on the ballot paper for something yeah. that nobody has done any work on whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can, under, I can almost understand Labour not having any uh, preparation in this sort of thing because it is something they just sort of thrown out almost in a panic. But this is a but they, fundamental... They, they've been talking about it for years, yeah. though. They, you know, it keep, they keep coming back to it. But again, with, no, with, with nothing solid behind it, so they've not got any further forward than just words. Well, the thing is, neither have the Lib Dems, and federalism for them is as fundamental to the, their ideology as independence is for the SNP. Mm -hmm. And yet, the Lib Dems don't have a plan either. Mm -hmm. 
So until either of them get their act together, I, I just don't. I don't think we should pay any more attention. Kezia Dugdale, uh, it, it seems, doesn't even have a great deal of support from Jeremy Corbyn and UK Labour yeah. on this plan. I mean that that that's been highlighted a couple of times. So to, th that it seems to me to be quite shambolic. And and what I don't understand is why um, they aren't held a little bit more to account for that. Because they because they're essentially sort of propo proposing things, you know, really serious changes, constitutional changes, as has the SNP for years and been scrutinised um, endlessly for it. And again, rightly so, these are big decisions to be making. They deserve the same scrutiny on their plan. But I think in some ways maybe they're not getting that scrutiny because, like you say, I think a lot of the press may be looking at that going, that's nice labour. Yeah, there's, there's, that, there is there's, nothing to There's no plan, it. there's no yeah. money, there's nothing here to look at. You've been saying this for ages, you've been calling for Home Rule since you were founded. Okay, cool. Well, if they're saying that... Wait to not, see where that goes. If they're saying that, they're not saying it very loudly. Because well. it seems to me that whenever Scottish Labour puts out a press release or does a photo call, a, a press conference about federalism, it generates another headline about federalism. Well, it's true. Gordon, Gordon, Brown got, like, Gordon Brown got that front cover from yeah. the Daily Record on the day of the SNP's conference. Um, and again, like Gordon Brown is not in a like if the, if the Scottish Labour Party are not in a position to deliver federalism, Gordon Brown definitely isn't. Mm. He's he's not in a position of power. He's just sort of wandering around talking about um, devolving powers. And and it's that frustrating thing again of like why is it that we only have this conversation about more powers coming to Scotland when there's a threat that it might leave? Like why is that the only time when when Labour yeah. suddenly care about? Oh, we've always cared about federalism, but it's only when the backs against the wall they actually start genuinely talking about it. Um, I find that very frustrating. Although um, someone did tweet something that I did really enjoy, which was like, um, like basically, Scottish Labour is like, we have to have enough. We, we, we've had too much division. There should be less division than just also Scottish Labour. We have a third option to throw out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> it's just, okay, thanks, guys. Uh, okay, <laughs> that's time to bring us towards the end of today's show. Aww. I know, it's uh, what a shame. <sighs> it's such a cheerful show it's been as well. <laughs> but before we wrap it up, we're going to play another exciting game of Did They Tweet It? Where I read out three tweets from somebody online, and the two of you have to try and work out which one of the three is made up, and which two are real. And the focus this week is Katie Hopkins. Aww. So I had to go through that oh, Twitter feed and funny. just oh man hope you've not been going through mine as well <laughs> <laughs> next week on Did They Tweet It <laughs> great day <dial. laughs> have I ever won this game I, <sighs> I don't know but I, I mean remember. I feel like this one's probably going to be very obvious so, so we'll see okay so three tweets and uh, you have to tell me which so one we're telling you which one she didn't tweet which one is not true okay. which one she did not tweet right. so tweet number one multiculturalism works we all die together that was in response to the London attack. Um, tweet two. Now is the time to remain calm and wait for all the facts in London before we make any judgments. Also in response to London. Tweet three. Nicola knows this is her last chance before she falls apart and dissolves into a mass of muddly, puddly gingerness. Okay, I'm going to say... I think that she didn't tweet number two because it sounds too calm and reasonable. Okay. Okay. See, I'm going to go with three because I can completely believe that one and two happened within about 13 seconds of each other. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so, so we've got, you, you don't believe it because it's far too reasonable a position for Katie Hopkins to have taken. Yeah. And, and, and you're going for that option because she's a contradiction <laughs> in terms. Therefore, it makes sense that she'd have contradictory <laughs> things. And we've got people voting as well um, out there. Okay, so we'll start then with multiculturalism works. We all died together in response to London. That one, she did tweet, obviously. Brings us on to the next oh. one. <laughs> is okay. Now is the time to remain calm and wait for all the facts in London before we make any judgments. That is the made-up one, because that is far, <laughs> far too reasonable uh, uh, a position for Katie Hopkins to take it. So congratulations, so Angela. What's, what's the prize? Your prize is absolutely nothing. Oh. Just a general sense of smugness. Just victory. Superiority yeah. over She's going to be lording this over yeah. me. Sorry, <laughs> <for> <laughs> week. Yep. 
I'm just get, not coming into the office. Yeah. I should get, I should get a scoreboard going. <laughs> Angela versus guest. We'll yeah, just see each that's a good idea. We'll get that going. Really yeah, really nice in the background there. The I can just wheel it in when we come to the end of the show every time. Yeah, That'd be excellent, actually. How does it feel to be uh, humiliated live in front of the nation, Craig? <laughs> Oh, it's a daily experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, that does bring us to the end of this week's exciting episode of Blether Together. Thank you to everyone who watched, commented, and gave us a wee share out there. As always, we do appreciate it. And please do feel free to keep leaving comments down below. We do read all your feedback, and we do uh, appreciate it. Um, thank you to both of my guests who come in and join me today. It's, as always, a pleasure to have you. Uh, and thank you to you for tuning in every week at 3pm. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's good to have an audience who actually is interested in what we have to say. So that's, that's really nice. Uh, we will be back again next week at 3pm again on Thursday, where we will be talking about whatever happens between now and then, uh, which will probably be the Scottish Parliament's voted to um, leave... Oh, sorry, not voted to leave the UK. <laughs> begin. <laughs> oh, that would be exciting. Um, <laughs> Shut out for that. Shut out for that. Breaking news. <laughs> Uh, but the Scottish Parliament will have voted to um, begin the process of leaving the UK, or rather to hold a referendum to leave the UK. Stephen uh, um, yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Writing the headlines now. For, yep. Writing it's the like news. National claims. <laughs> no, um, uh, national exclusive. Exclusive. We're leaving. Um, that will have happened. The EU. Nope. The UK. You've totally thrown me now. The UK will have begun the process of leaving the EU by a couple of days, so we'll be able to see how terrible the markets are right about then. That'll be a fun update. Uh, and who knows what happened between now and then? So actually, you don't need to tune in next week. Yeah, we've already told you what's going to happen. We've told you we've got it's it. Fine. We've got it down. Um, <laughs> but yeah, three pm next week. Please do tune in then. Thank you very much for tuning in today, and we'll see you all then. We hope you have a lovely week, and catch us later on. Bye.